Welcome back. Did everybody miss having this class on Friday? Who said yeah? A for the day. A for the day. <laughs> I hope you guys did fun stuff on Friday. Anybody do anything fun on Friday? Float the river? You could float the river. It might not be too much fun if you were having to go home or something. Okay, so we are behind, uh, but fortunately this term I build in some flexibility. Uh, if you look on the schedule page, you'll see that I have a, uh, enti an entire lecture before the uh, exam that's listed as review. We'll probably gobble that time up now, um, but that's fine. People have asked me where the exam will go to. I haven't decided. I will follow a, find a logical place for us to stop, and that will likely be Friday, but I, sometime Friday, but I can't tell you until I see how far I get going with my lecture. So. I will definitely let you know. The exam uh, is a week from Wednesday. So, yay. Um, yes. And um, we'll talk about that more at that time. All right, so last time when I was uh, talking, I, uh, finishing, I was finishing talking about different transporters, and I got up to these two terms right here that I didn't get a chance to cover. Some of you have noted that uh, I did mention them in my um, highlights, and so now I want to make sure that you know what those terms uh, refer to. When we look at the categories of transporting uh, things across membranes, we put the, the, the proteins really into two main categories. Your book lists three here, but we won't talk about the uniporters on the end. Uh, we're more interested in the, the first two, the antiporter and the symporter, and they're very simple. Uh, these are membrane, transpor better, membrane transport proteins that do movement of molecules across membranes. They just do them in different ways. So an antiporter is, as you see on the screen, it's, it's moving two molecules in opposite directions, one in, one out. It might be two or three. We're not counting numbers here. So, But moving molecules in opposite directions. The uh, symporter uh, moves molecules in the same direction. That could be both in, it could be both out. So it really varies uh, on what's being moved. And you'll also see, as I noted in the highlights, sometimes that people spell this S-Y-N porter, uh, and I'll take either uh, of those as acceptable. So S-Y-N or S-Y-M, okay? Um, another term that, you, that we frequently associate with these that we don't see on the screen, but I'll tell you, um, is a transporter that is electrogenic, okay? An electrogenic transporter is a transporter whose action causes charge to change as a result of what they're moving. So last time when I talked about the sodium potassium ATPase, I said it was kicking three sodium ions out and it was kicking two, sodium, uh, two potassium ions in. That means every time it does a cycle of transport, one net positive charge is going outside. That's electrogenic, meaning that the charge is changing as a result of the action of the transporter. If we look at the glucose transporter that I talked about, let's say a glut protein, a glut protein, for example, which allows glucose to come into the cell, is electroneutral because there's no charge associated with glucose. And that would, would simply uh, indicate that. You had a question? Would, would that also be an antiporter or is electro, electrogenic transporter? Electrogenic and, and electroneutral have nothing to do with whether they're antiporters or symporters. It's just as a result of their action does the charge change. Okay. Okay, so electrogenic involves a net change of charge as a result of their action. Okay, um, let's see here. The last uh, transport I want to talk about is an interesting one. I mentioned it to you briefly uh, because it's an example of a uh, transport system that uses the energy from an electrochemical gradient to move things. Okay, now. This is where students sometimes get confused. Let's, let's remember that cells can pump things outside of cells. We saw the example of the sodium transporter kicking things out. And I talked about how that sodium gradient could be moved, could be used to kick calcium out, right? Remember that? So we saw that there's a concentration gradient and there's an energy associated with a concentration gradient. We can use that energy to do active transport. 
And so in active transport, we're moving something against a concentration gradient. In this case, the thing that's being moved against a concentration gradient is the sugar lactose. So in this example, cells have more lactose inside of them than they do outside. But they want more. And the reason they want more is this is probably a little bacterial cell that's floating around that whenever it's got lactose, it wants to grab it as quick as it can so because it, it never knows when it's going to have another meal. So it has to move lactose against the concentration gradient. It has to move it into the cell. And so it uses a proton gradient to do that. In this case, the protons are in higher concentration outside the cell than inside. So the protons want to come in. They have an energy associated with them because of the different concentrations on the outside versus the inside. That concentration is used to bring lactose in. And that's what you see happening here. So we see, uh, first of all, a proton binding to the transporter. Lactose binding next. And the binding of the lactose causes a shape change. We see the shape change go as we see here. Lactose gets dumped in. The proton gets dumped in. And we get back to where we started. You notice this is an active transport system, no ATP. So ATP can be an energy source for a transport system, but it doesn't have to be. It depends on the system. This system doesn't require ATP. It's using a concentration gradient to move something against a concentration gradient. That's kind of a cool thing. Yes, sir? So is this an example of a symporter? Is this an example of a symporter? Well, you tell me what's happening here. So they're both going the same direction. So this would be an example of a symporter, yes? What else could we say about this, this uh, uh, transporter? Electrogenic. It's electrogenic because we're seeing positive charge change, or seeing charge change as a result of action of this guy. So it's both electrogenic and it's a symporter. OK, so those are the, the uh, transport proteins I wanted to talk about. I want to spend a little bit of time talking about a subject that students find uh, fairly interesting, as do I. And I, I will tell you I'm not an expert at it, but uh, it's uh, nonetheless a fascinating topic. And that is the topic of nerve transmission. Nerve transmission is really remarkable in how well it works, how fast it works, and how efficiently it works. Okay? Without our nerves firing, we're in pretty deep doo-doo. We stick our hand in a fire, and it takes an instant, and we feel. We know that we've done something wrong. Our nervous system tells us we've done something wrong when we do that. So what I want to do is spend a little bit of time telling you how, uh, at least at a simple level, that nervous system works, and then uh, we'll, we'll move on. So we, we can't teach you an entire t uh, topic of neurosciences here, but we can at least see how nerve cells work. All right, so how do nerve cells work? I've got this finger, and I'm sticking it in the fire. I'm not a smart guy, but you guys already know that. And all of a sudden, my nerve cell that responds to pain out there says, hey, Ahern, uh, you did something dumb here. Let's try to get that finger out of that fire as quickly as we can. How does it tell me that? All right. Well, it does that by communicating information. And that information it's communicating is happening as a result of chemical gradients. Chemical gradients. Okay. Here's this nerve cell. This nerve cell has been sitting here literally as a loaded gun waiting to fire. Your nerve cells are that. They're loaded guns waiting to fire. And the reason I like to think of them as loaded guns is because they're just like a regular cell in one sense, in that what have they been doing? They've been pumping out sodium, and they've been pumping in potassium. They have, as a result of that action, more sodium outside of them than inside. And they have more potassium inside than outside. There's a gradient. Sodium wants in, potassium wants out. Okay? This nerve cell, when I stick the finger in the fire, fires the gun first by doing the following thing. It opens up a specific gated channel that is specific for sodium. It allows sodium to freely move. Well, what's going to happen if sodium concentration is higher outside than inside? 
what's going to happen is sodium is going to come rushing in through that open gate. And only sodium. We'll see in a, in a bit how that works. Only sodium comes rushing in. When sodium comes rushing in, we see the concentration of sodium rising inside. So the chemical gradient is changing. We also see the charge changing because now we've got a whole bunch of positive charges rushing in. The voltage is changing. So the potential is changed as a result of that very first thing that happens. And because we've got a nice gradient set up, those sodium ions are racing through there. They're racing through there. We want our nerves to work fast and chemical gradient. When we poke a hole in the dam, we want that water coming out as quickly as possible. In this case, the water is the sodium rushing into this nerve cell. We've started the process of transmitting that information to the brain. Sodium comes rushing in. All right? We see sodium rushing in. We're depolarizing the membrane. It's polar when there's a charge distribution. However, the cell has to act as quickly as, it pos as, as possible. We want that nerve cell to be ready to fire again as quickly as it can. So the nerve cell says, whoa, look at this voltage change going on there. We've got to do something about this charge difference. And so the nerve cell, after the sodium gates have opened, opens the potassium gates. Why does it open the potassium gates? Well, potassium is higher concentration inside. What happens if we have a charge rushing in that's positive and we have a, a highly positive potassium ion? What's it going to do? It's going to go rushing out. So the cell opens the potassium gates to let potassium escape and try to balance that charge difference. So sodium in, potassium out. Well, what's happening in that nerve cell? Well, now at the very point of where I stuck my finger in, that nerve cell has all of a sudden a high concentration of sodium and it's losing potassium. What do you suppose happens along the length of the nerve cell? Well, that gradient information is transmitted along the entire nerve cell. And that first process that you saw at the very end of the cell happens repeatedly at various junctures along the way because any perturbation in that voltage change that happens as a result of the movement of those ions causes more gates to open, 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 all the way along the nerve cell. Now what's remarkable is how fast that happens. In milliseconds, you've got a signal back that you've got your finger in a place where it shouldn't be. Get it out of there. That's pretty darn cool. Okay? How does the nerve cell recover? Well, I've, I've told you how the nerve cell basically uh, depolarizes. How does it repolarize? The first thing that happens is the gates close. Duh-uh. If we want to hold water behind the dam, we darn sure better close the gate so water doesn't come rushing through. In this case, the sodium and potassium ions aren't rushing through, so those gates close. Closing of the gates allows the normal sodium, potassium, ATPase to start pumping sodium out and start pumping potassium in. That is getting back to the original state. During that phase, there's a recovery. And after those gradients are reestablished, that nerve cell is ready to fire again. A pretty remarkable process. OK, questions about that? Yes, sir? How long does it take to get back to normal? How long does it take to get back to normal? It depends a bit on the cell and uh, in the, on the order of seconds. It's not, it's not very long. Yeah, not very long. Yes, sir? CNS, even being sedentary, takes up so much of our daily caloric intake? Is the reason that these pumps take ATP uh, an explanation for why our central nervous system takes up uh, a decent amount of our um, uh, ATP? And the answer is yes. Yes, it is. Your brain and your eyes, which are really enormous um, signalers or responding to signalers, are uh, 
consuming disproportionate amounts of ATP in your body. Okay? Disproportionate amounts of ATP in your body. It's something like a quarter of all of your ATP, I think, goes through your brain. Yeah. Yes? So I know, like, you get burned for too long, you're after your signal and goes dead. Yep. So if you burnt too bad, your signaling goes dead. If you burnt yourself too bad, you probably have destroyed some nerve cells. That'll definitely do it. Yes, Jen. Chronic pain. chronic pain. Yeah, chronic pain is a common question I, I get with that. And chronic pain um, can arise from a variety of things, chronic irritation, uh, you know, an irritant that doesn't go away. Um, and chronic pain is, is difficult to manage and predict because what happens is your brain also has... Um, to some extent, an ability to filter so that if you have things that are constantly firing, 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 eventually your brain will, in some cases, ignore that. In, in some chronic pains, that doesn't happen. But things like you probably have noticed if you've ever been around something that really stinks, you're around it for a period of time, you don't notice it. And it's because the brain is saying, okay, you're distracting me too much with this. I'm, gonna, I'm going to ignore that. Now, uh, if you've ever worked in a lab with mercaptoethanol, really foul stuff, and somebody spills it, man, I tell you, a, a good way not to be popular in the lab is to spill mercaptoethanol. It's a really foul odor. And when you first walk in, you go, oh, my God, I mean, it's just too much. And the very tiniest amount will really give you this foul odor. odor. And after you're in it for an hour or so, you won't even notice it. Your brain just says, forget it. So, yeah. There are ways of dealing with chronic pain that some um, strategies involve using, um, and I'll talk about this at the end of the term, uh, the compound known as capsaicin. Capsaicin is the active ingredient in um, hot peppers. And so uh, one thought about the way that capsaicin does, uh, capsaicin works to relieve chronic pain is it's activating another set of, of, of receptors and getting the brain to just quit, it, quit paying attention to the one so much and uh, reduces the, the, the problem as a result of that. Yes, sir. Being numb is the I know a lot of people numb in the brain, so uh, <laughs> you, you let me walk into that one, didn't you? So being numb um, is a brain thing. I don't think I would agree with that, no. Um, I think what you're not, I'm not, again, I'm not an expert in this, but I, you know, you get your arm numb because you're leaning out the wrong way. You're probably uh, interfering with that ability of that, that nerves, the, those nerve cells to signal. So I would say no. Yes, sir. So local anesthesia, is that? Yeah. Local anesthesia. What's local anesthesia doing? So what typical various types of anesthesia are doing is they are permeabilizing these membranes. So they're basically inhibiting their ability to signal. They're inhibiting their ability to signal. And so they're confusing them. They're not signaling. The brain's going, what the hell is this all about? And as a consequence, you don't feel anything. Or in some cases, you, get, you become unconscious. Boy, there's a lot of questions. <laughs> okay. A couple quick ones. Yeah. Do nerve cells have a higher density than sympotassium ATP? That's a good question, and I believe they do. Yes. So, uh, for different degrees of the pair, is that because the particular bounds are preserving the I'm sorry, say, say it again. What causes a different degree of pain? Sometimes you feel pain. Sometimes what causes different degrees of pain? Okay. One of the things that would cause different degree of pain would be the number of nerve cells that are firing. So, if I stick myself with a pin, that's going to be a little bit different than if I smash my whole finger with a hammer. Right? So, I've got an awful lot more nerve cells that are firing in, in that case. Yes, one last question. How do you explain phantom pain? Explain what? Phantom pain. Phantom pain. Well, there's where your brain comes into it. Okay? Uh, people who have amputations will frequently describe feeling that missing foot or missing arm or whatever. And it's because the brain still expects it to be there. Um, I can't tell you in every case that's the, that's the case, but in many, many cases, the brain is still uh, associating that, that thing with being there. It's, it's confusing it. Okay, this is usually the one I get the most questions about. Okay, I said one last one. This will be the last one. Lawrence? Um, you said that potassium goes out right after sodium starts coming in. Doesn't that reduce the charge and reduce the action potential? If I misunderstood. It does change the charge and the action potential. So sodium goes, um, goes um, uh, in first, and then potassium goes out. Right. So that changes that. And so if you look at this thing, what's happening, you see depolarization happening. You see the repolarization starting to happen when the sodium gates open. Okay? You had a whole bunch of positive charges come in. Now you've got positive charges going out. That's before the pumps are even kicking in. Okay. 
It's only after the pumps have gotten back down into here that they're able to restore what was the original conditions. But the first response is to restore that voltage difference. That's why the, that's why the cells are actually opening those potassium gates. So potassium gates open more slowly than the sodium gates? They open after the, the, the question is, do they open more slowly? The answer is the potassium gates open after the sodium gates do. So the sodium gates always are the first signal. OK, cool stuff, very cool stuff. Um, nasty compounds, OK? Detrototoxin. Anybody like pufferfish? Okay. The toxic compound in pufferfish, pufferfish being a great delicacy in Japan, the toxic compound in pufferfish, you hear about people, a few people a year who die from pufferfish because the organs of the fish haven't been properly removed, uh, contain this toxin right here. This toxin blocks sodium gates. Blocks them. Okay. And blocking all your sodium gates, a neurotoxin will kill you. There's a depiction of what the potassium channel looks like. And I show you that, obviously, just to first of all, I'll show you the kind of cool complexity that proteins can have. But also to get you thinking a little bit about how is it possible that cells can have a protein that is specific for a specific ion. Let's think about this. Sodium ions and potassium ions. They're both charged positive ones. So they're not doing it on the basis of their charge. It has to be doing something with the, si with the size of the individual atoms, the electron clouds around them. Okay? Potassium is larger than sodium is. Potassium is larger than sodium is. So that means that potassium has got to have a wider opening into which it comes. Right? So if I have a potassium gate and it's only letting potassium through it, how in the world is that larger opening stopping something smaller like a sodium from coming through it? That's a pretty remarkable thing. Okay? The answer to the question, first of all, is that it's not done on the basis of size, at least for potassium gates. They are not excluding solely on the basis of size. There are energy considerations for how a potassium is excluding a sodium. Okay? Let's think about this. So I've got two different gates. I've got a sodium gate that lets only sodium ions pass. I've got a potassium gate that lets pretty much only potassium pass. There's a little bit of leakage, but not much. Okay. The sodium atom is smaller than the potassium atom. So if the potassium atom tries to go through a sodium gate, what's going to happen? Well, what's going to happen is that smaller sodium gate, it's going to be size excluded. Potassium won't fit into the sodium gate. On the other hand, sodium is smaller than potassium. Sodium atom will physically fit into the potassium gate. And as I've told you, there has to be some other exclusion besides size because a potassium gate cannot exclude a sodium on the basis of size because the sodium is too small. This figure shows us how it is, and it's confusing, so I'm going to take you through it, how a potassium gate excludes a sodium ion that is smaller than a potassium ion. You want molecular magic? You're seeing it on the screen right here. This is pretty cool stuff. A Nobel Prize was actually won for understanding how this works. We actually had the Nobel laureate for, who won for this uh, thing that you see on the screen here at OSU three or four years ago, and he talked to students. And he was a wonderful man. And you know what he told students? He came here. He came here and he sat and he met and he, he specifically said, I want to meet with students and I want to meet with pre-med students. I thought it was pretty cool because I'm a pre-med advisor, you know. And I work with some very talented pre-med students. And he told them something I absolutely loved. He said, you got to get out of that box that you're in. You got to think about problems more broadly and you got to think about your career more broadly. And if you're a pre-med student, the number one thing you should be doing 
is looking to see every other possible thing you should do besides medicine. Why did he say that? The reason he said that was because he was a pre-med. He went all the way through medical school. He got out, he was a practicing physician, and he says, I hate what I'm doing. But I didn't question any lo way along the way because when I was 10 years old, I thought I wanted to be a doctor. And he used that advice as a 10-year-old to go be a doctor. And by the time he was a 25-year-old, he realized that 10-year-old thinking didn't work very well for him. Now, I know nobody in here would have that happen, but uh, just in the remote chance that it does, so he got through medical school and he goes to his wife and he, they've paid a half a million dollars to get him through medical school and he says, honey, I'm ready for a career change. Now the remarkable thing is his wife says, what do you want to do? He says, I want to do research. And you know what she said? She said, okay. And he did. I'm not kidding. I'm not making this story up. Okay. And he went off and he did research and he won the Nobel Prize. And he said, you know, there's an awful lot of people that get in that, that category and they get out and they get in careers and they discover, ooh, I didn't investigate enough other things before I wanted to go there. I'm getting off subject, aren't I? Okay. So I want all you pre-meds in here to think about that. And you pre-vets. You pre-pharmacy. And you pre-dentists. Okay? Because everybody has to do that. It's very, very important to think outside that little box you want to put your head in. All right, let's get back to this little box. This little box involves a channel. And it involves a channel that's too big to physically exclude sodium. How does it exclude sodium? It turns out that size really does matter. <laughs> Why are you laughing at that? Size really does matter. The potassium channel is set up with its dimensions in such a cool way that it interacts with potassium ions very nicely. And it doesn't interact with those sodium ions so nicely. It's cold outside. You go out, you buy a pair of gloves. And you get a pair of gloves that fit nicely and they feel good. And you can do things with your hands and they work well, right? And you go out and you buy a pair of gloves that's six sizes too big and you try to work with those gloves, are you going to get anything done? No. Size matters. Okay? The sodium, the potassium channel is set up so that potassium comes along. And by the way, when we have an ion in the cell, we never have just a free ion. We have an ion surrounded by hydrogen bonds to water molecules because this is an aqueous environment. So in addition to having the size of the atom, we have this shell of water around it. These channels are set up so that that shell of water basically has to get stripped off in order for it to make it through. The shell of water has to get stripped off. As potassium enters the channel, its dimensions are perfect for the channel. The removal of those water molecules from the potassium takes a certain amount of energy. That's the energy invested as it starts. As it gets going further along and when it starts exiting the channel, it starts acquiring those waters again, okay, it regains that energy. And it regains them so nicely that there's a net energy gain in the potassium going through that. It's energy, I shouldn't say energy gain, but energy is released as a result of that potassium going through that channel. It's energetically favorable overall for potassium to move through that channel. Sodium comes through and like that little tiny hand inside that great big glove, it's wiggling around. It does not have its waters removed very effectively because its dimensions aren't right. As a consequence, the energy that's realized in regaining those waters as it comes through is much lower than it is in the case of potassium. As a consequence, sodium is energetically disfavored from moving through the potassium gate. That's a remarkable thing. Yes, sir? 
Does that mean the potassium has to enter the channel in a certain orientation? The answer is no, because potassium is basically a circular um, a molecule or a circular atom. No. Yes, sir. So it says resolvation within the calcium or within the potassium channel site, but if yep. it's within it, wouldn't it be a type of chelation and then resolvates on the other side? It is chelating as it's going through. And so we, we can see interactions of the potassium moving along the, 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 the spread of that channel. Yes, that's correct. But that, those chelations, those interactions that potassium is making with that protein are perfectly set up. It works really well. It doesn't work if the, if the, nuclei, or the atom is the wrong size. Pretty cool stuff. Other questions? Back there, Jared. Is there, or is there research on mutations of these proteins and how effective they are? I I'm sure there is. I'm sure there is. And you could imagine that very tiny changes in dimension might have some very drastic effects on the exclusion abilities of these. I I'm, not, I'm not familiar with that area, but I would, I would be amazed if that had not been done. Yeah. OK. Pretty cool. Let's see here. Um, this sort of depicts what's happening. We see that the entry, we see the stripping, we see the things making their way through, and the movement of one starts allowing others to go through, and they go all the way through. Finally, as they get through, they regain their waters. As we see over here, there's the resolvation happening, and the potassium ion has made its way in. Okay. Um, that's pretty cool. You know, these electric rays use chemical gradients to create enormous electrical potentials. That's how an electric ray kills its prey, is with an electrical charge because of chemical, electrochemical gradients that it has created from pumping. Okay, the last thing I want to talk about with respect to nerve cells uh, is how one nerve cell talks to another. How do nerve cells communicate with each other? What we see on the screen are two nerve cells. One that might have been out here that had my finger being burned and it's now going to communicate with another one up here, let's say. Okay? Here's the second nerve cell, here's the first nerve cell. How do materials, or how does that signal get from one nerve cell to the other? Okay? Well, first of all, that process occurs at what's called a synaptic cleft or a synaptic junction, right here. The, 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 uh, the uh, boundary between the two nerve cells, right in here. These two guys are placed right immediately next to each other so that when one does something, it disturbs the other one. And the thing that the one does is as a nerve signal is coming down, the first nerve, the first nerve cell has within it what are called synaptic vesicles. These synaptic vesicles are little circular blobs that contain chemicals in them. And that chemical has a name. That chemical is known as a neurotransmitter. These synaptic vesicles are full of neurotransmitters. So when the signal comes along, the synaptic vesicle fuses <coughs> with the membrane. We see a fusion that is happening here, and we see it dumping its chemical into that synaptic cleft. What does that chemical do? That chemical interacts with the next nerve cell, and it starts the whole process all over again. So when, the, when this neurotransmitter hits this guy, what happens? Sodium gates open, sodium rushes in, potassium gates open, potassium rushes out, and now the same thing is happening in this nerve cell that was happening previously in this nerve cell. Pretty cool stuff. Okay. There are a variety of different neurotransmitters, depends on the nerve cell. Acetylcholine is a very common one. There are many others. And it's at this point I usually take a minute and talk about drug addiction because drug addiction and some types of drug addiction actually play into this right here. Okay? They actually play into this right here. Let's imagine that these nerve cells are involved in giving a pleasurable feeling to you. Okay? We all have pleasurable feelings. We might get it from eating. We might get it from drinking. We might get it from our... Uh, uh, whatever. Uh, and <laughs> you guys are laughing at everything today. I just said whatever. You have dirty minds, okay? Or maybe you have clean minds and I have the dirty mind. I don't know. Maybe that's what it is. All right. But 
you feel good. You feel good about this, okay? So cocaine is a compound that elicits a very, um, high, it's a high, it's a very pleasurable feeling that happens. And cocaine is very addictive. And one of the reasons that cocaine is addictive is it does the following. Here is uh, a pair of, of uh, nerve endings that uh, when they fire will give a pleasurable response. Well, I've told you how a nerve cell will depolarize and then repolarize and basically go and um, uh, back to its original state. If this first nerve cell has fired into the second one, normally what happens is we've got this neurotransmitter out here and this neurotransmitter has to be removed because if it's not removed, it's going to continue to cause this guy down here to fire. So normally what happens in this pleasurable junction right here is that these neurotransmitters are released, but then they get recycled back into the original nerve cell. That causes their concentration out here to decrease. That causes the firing of this nerve cell to stop. What cocaine does is for some types of, um, of neurotransmitters, it interferes with the recycling of them. That it is, it interferes with the ability of the first nerve cell to retake up the, nerve the neurotransmitter. What does that mean? That means then that the neurotransmitter is going to stay in high concentration out here. This nerve cell is going to continue to fire, and you're going to get that pleasurable feeling for a longer period of time. It may be very intense. Because, oh, wow, I'm still getting it, I'm still getting it, I'm still getting it, okay? Well, of course, that's an addictive thing after a, a point of time, and that's one of the reasons that cocaine is addictive, as well as obviously problematic. Yes, sir? Does that also lead to desensitization over time, which requires the It does. It does. His question is, does that lead to desensitization over time? And it absolutely does, which is why it takes a bigger and bigger dose to get the same high over time. Yep, absolutely. Yes? Well, this, the, 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 um, the uh, body has a fixed number of synaptic vesicles, of course, because we are a finite organism, so yes. Um, and uh, the, as we lose nerve cell function, we will have fewer of those, yeah. Okay, how are we doing on time? We can get started on, on oxidative, um, uh, I'm sorry, mitochondria and oxidation. So, we're getting caught up. All right, so now, why did I spend all that time going through and telling you guys about transport across membranes? And now we're going to go over and going to talk about mitochondria. Well, it turns out that understanding membrane transport is really essential for understanding how mitochondria do what they do. Mitochondria combine really interesting features of membrane transport with chemical processes that involve oxidation, reduction, and synthesis of ATP. All of that is happening inside of your mitochondria. All right? So there are two major processes that occur in mitochondria that we're going to talk about. And don't confuse them. They do relate to each other, but they are completely separate processes. The first of those is known as electron transport. And it's in this process that we're finally going to see how those electrons in NADH and FADH2 get used. We're going to see how those, excuse me, how those electrons in NADH and FADH2 get used. Okay? To understand this, we first of all have to look at mitochondria. Okay, we've looked at mitochondria. All right. Here's a better view of mitochondria. This is a schematic representation of what a mitochondrion looks like. <coughs> As you can see, it's kind of a cool structure. And I like to think of it as kind of like a little capsule. And this shows the major features very nicely. The mitochondria has an outer membrane, shown in yellow. And to be honest, it doesn't do very much. A lot of things move through it. It's not a very uh, protective membrane. Okay? It provides a little bit of a barrier, but not a lot. The inner mitochondrial membrane, which is this convoluted thing that you see here in blue, 
is very impermeable to things. Most importantly for our purposes, it's very impermeable to protons. Okay? Protons can move somewhat through the outer membrane, but they cannot move very well at all through the inner membrane. In fact, they can't move at all for our, all, all intents and purposes. We see that these inner foldings of the blue have a name. They're called Christi. So you see this fold, 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 fold. Why do we have all those foldings? Well, the more it folds, the more surface area there is. And as we're going to see, all of the action in the mitochondrion occurs in the inner membrane. All of the action of electron transport and oxidative phosphorylation occurs in the Christi, that is, these inner foldings of the inner membrane. We also see that there's a section called the intermembrane space. That's just the gap between the inner membrane and the outer membrane. For our purposes, it doesn't do very much. And last, we see this section called the matrix. The matrix is where the liquid of the mitochondrion is located. We can think of the sort of equivalent of the cytoplasm inside the mitochondrion. And it's in here that the enzymes of the citric acid cycle and fatty acid oxidation are dissolved. The enzymes of the citric acid cycle and the fatty acid oxidation are dissolved in the matrix. And the one exception to that is the succinate dehydrogenase, as we will see, that's found in the membrane. Other than that, everybody else is pretty much dissolved in the matrix. Now, the inner membrane is very important in protecting against um, protons. Protons can't move across it except for places where cells let them in. This schematic is very simple, but it depicts for us the processes of electron transport and oxidative phosphorylation in the most simple of terms. Electron transport is shown over here in yellow. Oxidative phosphorylation is shown in red. And you see that both of them are occurring in the inner mitochondrial membrane. That's the gray thing here. That's the inner membrane. That's a, a folding of the inner membrane. In electron transport, what's happening is electrons are being dumped into proteins that we will see later. The electrons move from one protein to another protein to another protein. As a result of the movement of the electrons, protons get kicked out of the matrix and into the intermembrane space. That's where the proton concentration starts to grow. Okay. Well, when I put electrons in at one end, what happens to electrons as they're going through? Ele electrons have to have a final destination. And the final destination of electrons in the, in the electron transport system is oxygen to make water. Okay? The reason that we're breathing and the reason we breathe heavily when we're exercising is we need oxygen to absorb those electrons that we're generating from oxidative processes. If we run out of oxygen, we can't absorb any more electrons. So oxygen is, the, is what we call the terminal electron acceptor. Okay. Well, the result of action of the electron transport system is to kick protons out of the matrix into the intermembrane space. That creates an electrochemical gradient. You've seen this before. Okay. Should I close that door? I guess I will. I, I, OK. That means we have a higher concentration of protons outside than we have inside. Protons want in. There's energy in an electrochemical gradient, and, the elect and that electrochemical gradient is like what I like to think of as a battery that's just been charged. The charge is there. The energy of the protons coming back in is used to make ATP. And that's the oxidative phosphorylation part of the cycle. Electron transport over here, oxidative phosphorylation over here. They are interdependent. If I don't have a proton gradient, I can't possibly have oxidative phosphorylation. And conversely, as we're going to see, if I stop oxidative phosphorylation, 
the proton gradient starts getting bigger, bigger, bigger. Last time I talked about the difficulty of pumping water up into the balcony. And the more I pumped, the harder it got to pump. As that gradient gets larger and larger and larger, it becomes harder and harder and harder for this system to pump protons. Finally, it throws up its hands and says, I can't pump anymore. That means that electron transport requires oxidative phosphorylation going on. There's one exception that I'll tell you about next time, and, um, but I won't tell you about it here. Actually, maybe I will tell you about it here. It's kind of cool. Okay? Since we're talking about it in simple terms, I'm not going to dig into the details of stuff today. All right? I'm going to tell you about it. I've got five minutes, and this is, a, this is about the right amount of time. I'm going to tell you about a miracle diet drug. Okay? Everybody likes diet drugs, right? Diet drugs are perfect things, right? You take a pill, you go to bed, and you sleep, and you burn off all that excess fat. Right? I mean, you guys read the internet. You know it's true, right? You burn off all that excess fat, right? In your sleep. And you know what? There actually is a diet pill that'll do that. There is. Okay? There's a perfect diet pill that will do that. And it would do it. In fact, it's been known for over 100 years. When they discovered this miracle diet pill... They found that you took this before you went to bed and you woke up in the morning and you were a little bit warmer, but you actually burned fat in your sleep. How did it work? Well, how did it work? It did a really cool thing. This material is called dinitrophenol, DNP. It's called, specifically, it's called 2,4-dinitrophenol, 2,4-DNP. And when I say it's a perfect diet drug, I'm exaggerating a bit, but it's great at losing weight. Because what it does is it causes the mitochondrial membrane to become permeable to protons. Now when this guy pumps them out, protons come back in, what's happening to the synthesis of ATP? You're not making any ATP. Your body needs ATP, what's it going to do? Well, it's going to try to keep pumping more protons and more protons, and where is it getting the electrons to pump those protons from? Oxida oxidation, right? We're burning things in our sleep. The perfect diet drug. Well, perfect except for the fact that 10% of the people who took it died. <laughs> I am not exaggerating. This is before there was a Food and Drug Administration. It was really good. If you were in that 90%, wow, man, you're looking thin. Oh, yeah, well, I take some DNP, right? Okay. Now, as we will see later, the reason I said that you wake up warm, well, actually, you guys can probably figure that out. Why would you wake up warm? It's yeah, you're burning things that are exergenic, that are releasing energy. Like we saw in glycolysis, we saw the Big Bang reaction. Citric acid cycle releases energy. The more of it we do, the more heat's generated, the more warm we get, the less ATP we make. No, you can't take just a little bit. Do you want to take a little bit of arsenic? Just a little bit? It'll kill some cells. Maybe I'll kill some fat cells, right? No, you can't do that. All right. We'll talk about that next time. How's that? So if the...